Welcome to the Logan for Liberty podcast. I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest where the sun shines so bright only to rain just a couple hours later. I hope you are all having a fantastic day. Today is a new day. It's August 1st. It's a Wednesday. And I did a podcast yesterday. I will have a podcast every Tuesday. And if I have time, I will squeeze in an extra podcast either on a Monday or even a Wednesday. And I did my podcast yesterday, uploaded it a little bit late. And today I am doing one for Wednesday, recording it. And I say, let's get started without further ado. I guess I have gotten started, haven't I? So this one, it's kind of inferior, infuriate, I can't speak. It, there's a couple stories in here. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, there's a couple stories in here that will piss you off. And then I will leave the best story for last, but it's still kind of serious. Today we're going to talk about the police state. And not the police state as in all oh, the police. No, I mean the laws... Well, it doesn't really matter, does it? You, you'll see what I mean. So, what order do I want to go in? I'll start with the worst one, in my opinion. And then I will go, obviously, to... I have three stories that I want to talk about. Or three articles that I want to go through. Sorry about that background noise. I have three articles that I want to go through. The first one's going to be the worst. The second one... It's pretty bad, but I don't think it's as bad as the first one. And then the last one, it's, um, I I don't know if funny would be the right word. It's kind of funny, I guess. Or the idea of it is, is silly. It's amazing that adults will do this type of stuff. Um, the first two articles come from Reason.com or Reason Magazine. And the very last one comes from the Mises Institute. So, without further ado, let's get started. So, okay, the one that's going to piss you off the most, I feel like, will be... Well, I'll just read the title. School strip searches 22 6th grade girls because a cop thought they were hiding $50 in their underwear. Um... Yeah, so I want to start off with that one because it's, in my opinion, the grossest one. There is a bit of a, not a rebound. When I'm doing podcasts, for some reason I can never think of language. I can't think of words. Not a rebound. What's the word I'm looking for? Oh, whatever. It doesn't matter. Let's go. When $50 went missing during the choir class's 6th grade field trip, Lanier Middle School's police officer informed its assistant principal that sometimes girls like to hide things in their bras and panties. The assistant principal then ordered the choir's 22 female members, it isn't clear whether there were any boys in the choir, to report to the school nurse for school search or for uh strip searches sorry i can't read although the nurse loosened their bras and checked around the waistband of their panties no money was found the search at the texas public school was in any case brazenly improper and probably probably violated the students rights that's according to a recent decision by the u.s court of appeals For the Fifth Circuit, the girls had filed a federal lawsuit against the school district, which readily agreed that it had violated their rights under the Texas Constitution. A federal judge, nevertheless, dismissed the lawsuit, concluding that the girls had failed to state constitutional claim. The Fifth Circuit reversed that decision last week. Um, So basically, a judge threw out the case on side of the school strip search because the sixth grade girls didn't state that they had a constitutional right. Does that sound insane to you? Because it sounds insane to me. How are you to expect sixth grade girls 
understand what their constitutional rights are. So what, they're in sixth grade, they're 12 years old? Are, would, would they be 12 years old? 12 years old for sixth grade, seventh grade would be 13, eighth grade would be 14, then high school freshman, 15, sophomore, 16, junior, seven. yeah. So they're, they're around 12, 11, 12 years old. And they are expected to know their constitutional rights. Otherwise, they are allowed to be strip searched. That's insane to me. That is 100% insane to me. To be fair, the consolation is that uh, it was a female nurse that did the search instead of a male principal. That is the probably the court's decision towards the end. And the fact that they used a nurse to do the strip search, that's the only sort of caveat. That's the only sort of softening to this kind of disgusting story was that they were at least... Uh, uh, professional enough to have a female do it and the court reversed the federal judge's decision decision who for some reason thinks that it's a six-year-old girl's duty to make sure that you know that she has constitutional rights when I was in sixth grade I don't think I even knew what the Constitution was so there's that here are the alleged facts taken together and assumed to be true. Permit the reasonable interference, i.e. the claim has facial plausibility that the risk of public officials conducting unconstitutional searches was or should have been a highly predictable consequence of the school district's decision to provide its staff no training regarding the Constitution's constraints on searches. Tech Dirt's Tim Crushing writes that he hopes the school's police officer is now chronically underemployed. Yeah, I do too. <clears throat> I do too. It's, it's gross. 50 bucks. And 50 bucks, just, oh, I, I don't know, I, I needed no more details about the story. No one was looking for weapons or even illegal drugs. Thank you. That's exactly what I was thinking. It was cash, something easy to lose. That $50 has gone missing does not necessarily mean it was stolen. That it may have been stolen does not necessarily mean the female class members would have stashed it in their undergarments. Yeah, they probably would have put it in their pockets. They're sixth grade kids. I don't expect their IQ to be that high to where they're able to think about their surroundings to the extent of actually interacting with it in a malicious way. Crushing adds, the district's policy for searches is a mess, an unconstitutional mess. As the court points out, it gives no evidence to administrators on how to reach its self-generated standard of reasonable cause before performing a search. However, it does tell administrators searches by school personnel should be as non-intrusive as possible, and only when there is a reasonable belief contraband might be found. The only discipline handed out for this mass violation of rights what was a memo chastising the principal for performing a search to find something not actually considered to be contraband. But the court points out that this memo misses the whole point of constitutional protections and the school's obligation to leave those and their students unmolested. Students aren't prisoners and schools aren't prisons. But these distractions blur when school districts rely on police officers and aggressive disciplinary measures to maintain order. In my opinion, the only, the only reason why you should have a police officer or the only goal or duty of a police officer on a school campus is to stop the act of violence and to protect them against a mass shooting if there will ever be one at this specific school. It's ridiculous. Imagine if you had a kid, whether it's a boy or a girl, and they were strip searched for $50. And guess what? They didn't find the $50 on your kid, so your kid got molested by an adult by a, a grown adult's hands going in their undergarments for 50 bucks. How would that make you feel? That would make me feel terrible. I would be so pissed. I would be down there if I had a kid and somebody would be getting chewed out. It's a disgusting story. And to the credit of the school though, they had a nurse do it, a woman nurse. That's really the only thing that this school or these employees get credit for. Other than that, 
I don't know. It's it's disgusting. It's gross. Just I don't know. Punish them, all of them, and and the thing is, is in this specific case, there was no fifty dollars found, and they assumed that one of the girls had taken the fifty dollars. I don't know if you have experience with this, but me, on the other hand, I lose stuff all the time. I lose my car keys. I lose my wallet. I I have lost. A wallet one time and I had to replace my driver's license I had to replace my debit card I had to well I lost 180 bucks and I'm not gonna say that you don't think that somebody stole it because my mind went into that territory there was a girl I was kind of seeing at the time kind of seeing I thought she had taken it she was I don't want to say a junkie but kind of uh, in, in the sense of marijuana, I guess. But she seemed like... She, she was one of those girls that would have stolen for for pot. I don't think it was her. I, I don't know where it went. I think... Because uh, I used to wear gym shorts a lot. This was when I was in high school. I used to wear gym shorts a lot. Wow, this is kind of a tangent. I used to wear gym shorts a lot, so it probably slipped out of my shorts. Anyway, I lose everything. I lose TV remotes. I lose... My wallet, I lose money, I lose my car keys, I lose my house key, I lose my mailbox key, I lose almost everything. So the fact that they initially thought it was one of the girls is kind of gross. Uh, w where did the teacher or people check for 50 bucks? It's 50 bucks. And who did the 50 bucks belong to? I wish the article would have went over that. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Alright, on to the next story. Um, so, <clears throat> this story, it's bad, but I didn't have it as the first story because it doesn't involve underage kids getting molested by adults for 50, bu for 50 bucks. It's pretty bad, though, because it shows you the corruption of certain districts certain uh, executive branch government agencies such as police officers or even judges in some states including michigan is that a surprise because that's where detroit is detroit is a mess therefore you could probably assume that the surrounding cities and the surrounding state is a mess i don't think that's unreasonable to assume I think the only good thing that Michigan has to offer is Justin Amash, congressman. <clears throat> Close to 1,000 people in Michigan had their property seized by police or government officials last year, even though they were neither convicted nor sometimes even charged with committing a crime. You see, I can understand the act of taking property from a criminal who has committed a violent crime. I could understand taking property away from somebody who committed a crime that has affected somebody else. Therefore, you need a way to compensate for somebody else. But these are police officers stealing property for the sake... It's a asset forfeiture. They're trying to get money. They're trying to get a nice bonus. And sometimes this property includes cash or change or something that you can sell for a pretty decent return. That's the bad news. The good news is that we have this information at all. In 2015, Michigan passed legislation that mandated local law enforcement agencies report more information to the state about the extent of their seizures. The Department of State Police just released its first report that encompassed all agencies for a full calendar year. Law enforcement agencies across the state seized more than $13 million in cash and property in 2017. And while State Police Director Christy Atu claims in the report's introduction that all those seized assets were amassed by drug traffickers, that's not really what the numbers show. So I want, uh, okay, so something comes to my mind. <clears throat> Whether you think drug traffickers should have their money seized from them or not is besides the point. 
I personally would like to see drugs decriminalized. I think that would go a long way. Regardless, that's not the point. How many of civil asset forfeiture wasn't reported? How many times did they send in a group of cops to bust a drug trafficker and then they took some of the money and they just split it up between them and then they didn't report it? I want to know if that's possible, if that's happened. Certainly some law enforcement agencies in Michigan would be that corrupt. I have no proof. I don't know if this actually happened. It's just a question that I'm posing and I wonder if they will go over that in the article or if there's ever been a case of that. Because... The government writing a law to regulate itself to me is kind of funny. It doesn't seem like it would work. I don't know. I guess that's a question that will go unanswered. Tom Gan Gannert? Tom Gantert? Okay. Tom Gantert, managing editor of Michigan Capital Confidential, which is published by the Mackinac... Mackinac? Center for Public Policy, what the hell, Michigan, drilled down into the report and noted that 956 people who had their money or private property seized last year were not convicted of a crime. Of course, those 736 people were not even charged with a crime for which property forfeiture was permitted. And yet, such forfeiture happened quite frequently. To put it in a larger context... It happened to 14% of the people who had their stuff taken. Um, that's crazy. That's crazy. <clears throat> that's close to a thousand people who had property taken without being charged for a crime. And close to 800 people who had property taken for committing a crime that wouldn't even be permitted to be punished by property forfeiture. That's crazy. That just shows you the corruption of the state. Police and prosecutors are able to essentially legally steal people's property under the process of civil asset forfeiture. Under civil forfeiture, criminal convic convictions are not necessary. Instead, police and prosecutors basically accuse the property itself of being connected to a crime using lower evidentiary thresholds and complicated bureaucratic and administrative procedures. Civil forfeiture subverts the typical legal process by forcing citizens to prove themselves and their property innocent of crimes rather than forcing prosecutors to prove guilt. In other words, you are guilty until proven innocent. It's amazing. Thus, citizens can have their stuff taken by the government without first being convicted. There's been a growing backlash to the use of civil asset forfeiture, and some states are attempting to restrain the police by requiring convictions before money and property can be taken. Michigan does not currently require a conviction, but some lawmakers are working on changing the rules. The state's house passed a bill in May that would require convictions before forcing somebody to forfeit property and cash valued at less than $50,000. It has not yet been taken up by the state Senate. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay, I like that. That it would require convictions before forcing somebody to forfeit property and cash valued at less than $50,000. Perhaps knowing that more than one out of ten folks who have had their property taken from them aren't even convicted might be helpful information to convince senators to vote for change. One of the difficulties in pushing for asset forfeiture reforms is that poor transparency requirements have left citizens Unclear about how extensive the practice is, police and prosecutors typically insist that the seizures are all from drug traffickers and other criminals without strong reporting guidelines. Citizens have no way of knowing the true circumstances of the seizures and where the money is going. In other words, almost one out of every ten person who has had their property seized from them did not need their property seized from them. They either weren't convicted of a crime or they weren't convicted of, of a crime that is punishable by asset forfeiture. 
but they got it. The state has to make their money. So damn Detroit using up all those funds. Now, thanks to Michigan's new reporting law, we do know, and it's not a good look for Michigan. Gantert notes that there are currently more than 2,000 folks in Michigan who face having their property seized while charges are still pending. If the law isn't changed, some of those folks may lose their property or money even if they're never convicted. Um, yeah, that's... I guess I could keep saying that's insane without actually talking about how that's insane. Imagine you have not committed a crime. There's no proof that you've been committed a crime, but you are going to be treated that you are guilty. And because they're treating you like you're guilty, even though you haven't been proved to be guilty, they're going to take your property as punishment. Or imagine that the crime is a petty crime that doesn't warrant the state taking her property, but that's how you're going to be punished anyway, by the state taking her property. And what's insane is that the state can take your property and money, even if it's not related to the crime. Isn't that what fines are for? For you to pay them to the state? If you are charged with a crime? You're given a citation or a ticket? I don't know, that just sounds really insane to me. Uh, listen, I believe in simple things. I believe in private property, life, and liberty. And this is a violation of private property rights. And it's, in a way, a violation of your liberty if somebody's violating your property rights when there's no proof that you've committed a crime. It's... I don't know. Um... But what, um, the House in Michigan, though, to their credit, did pass a bill that basically says that you need to be convicted before the police or the state can take your property or cash that is valued less than $50,000. Um, it has to go through the Senate. I don't know if it's been through the Senate yet. This is somewhat of an old-ish article, but it's I've been wanting to report on this for a while because, to me, it's insane. It's the state coming in and violating your property rights. Now, you can be a Blue Lives Matter person. Fine. You know, you can support the police. That's fine. I think a lot of police officers are good people. I don't think all police are bad. But any institution that has authority over you or has the ability to take authority over you, will do that, and they will exploit their authority over you. The police are supposed to protect and serve you, but they're not protecting and serving you. They are stealing your property when you have not been convicted of a crime. Or if there's even, there's no proof that you've com committed a crime. This reverses the whole notion of rule of law, and not only rule of law, but why can't I talk today? <laughs> um, due process. Just say goodbye to rule of law and due process. It's not rule of law, it's ruled by law. And I don't know what the opposite of due process would be. Authoritarian process? You're, it, it's not due process, it's just process. State process? It just, the rule of law is supposed to protect you as an individual. But you can't be protected if the state can violate any sort of liberty that you have. Any sort of rights that you have. And if simple, just smaller institutions on a local level, if they can infringe upon your rights, seize your property without due process, then imagine what the federal government can do. It's just so bizarre that we've gotten so far past the idea of due process. You know, you go through, there's a system of checks and balances to keep the government at bay to make sure power isn't too centralized. And then we, we also have due process to set up a rule of law to not, to, to give law enforcement a guiding principle or a rule book 
that tells them what to do. That tells them, all right, in this situation, you should do that. And you have to follow these laws. So you're protecting the public. So you're actually serving the public. But that that's not what, what, what this is. This is the complete opposite of due process. This is, we're the state. We're our entity. You are our servants. We're not here to serve and protect. We're here to enslave and punish. We're entitled to your property because you're a criminal, even if we can't prove it. I don't know how many other ways I can really explain this, but to me, it's absolutely insane. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about something that's a little less insane. Well, no, it's just as insane. It's more insane. Um, I mean, this is still part of a police state, in my opinion. The first one was a violation, was basically state pedophilia, state sanctioned pedophilia. Well, I guess in this case, it was a uh, school sanctioned pedophilia. And I guess to the state's credit, well, except for one federal judge, they were trying to reverse it. And then we also have a state, state, state sanctioned property theft. And this one, it just shows the absurdity of the way some people think. Some people think that they can use the law to force you to do good, right? Some people think that the law, that they can use the law to change your behavior because they deem your behavior as immoral. And that's a really dangerous way of thinking. Because if you think that you can use the law to shape somebody's opinion, to make them do something that you think is moral, that opens the door for laws almost about anything that you can possibly think of. We have laws against drug use because we think that drugs are bad, it ruins the human soul, and it can ruin society, it can ruin communities. Okay, fine, let's say I'm on board with you. So, what next? The police can then disregard your property rights to enforce those drug laws. They can bust down your door, no knock raids, shoot your family dog and get away with it. Why? Because there might have been some drugs inside your house. And it all stemmed from the fact that we thought that we could change your behavior and make a better society through a law. And that's the wrong way to think about laws. Laws are simply, laws, there should be only two types of laws for the most part. This is the way that we should look at laws. There's at least two main principles that I can think of. We should have laws to give citizens legal recourse against... All right, sorry, there's three tiers of laws that I think we should have. We should have laws that give citizens legal recourse against a government tyranny. We should have laws that restrict the government's power, a.k.a. limited government. And even if you think limited government should be part of universal health care, even if you think socialism is fantastic or you support Keynesian economics, okay, fine, let's say you do. You support Keynesian economics. You think the government should have a whole textbook of stuff that it can be involved in, a hundred textbooks, a million pages of stuff that the federal government or the government in general should be involved in. Let's say that, okay, fine, you can have that. But at least admit that the government should be limited in those abilities and that the government should follow a strict set of rules. With that being said, the third tier of law that we should have or that we should base our laws on are to give citizens legal recourse against other citizens. Two of those can basically be the same, the citizens recourse against other citizens and citizens recourse against the state. You can just say that it's protecting their rights. They have rights and we recognize that the state can violate your rights and so can individuals. So legal recourse against a violation of rights and then we can branch that off into legal recourse against the state, legal recourse against individuals, and then laws that restrict the state's ability to do anything. Basically a constitution or a charter. That says, here's the government's power, here's what it can do, that's only what it can do. Of course, 
no words on piece of paper will ever stop the growth or the state stop the growth of state or stop the state from violating your rights as long as a majority of the population thinks that it's the state's right to do these things to tax you to seize your property or as long as they think that just because 51% of all people agree on something as long as there was people that believe that pure democracy is how a government should be run the state will always have authority over you limiting the state entirely comes down to the culture and the society the citizens and what they believe the state should and shouldn't do and in the United States we're almost at a crossroads I think I've rambled on long enough I want to get to the story because it's it's not state pedophilia and it's not state sanctioned um, theft well in a sense it is there is an aspect of that this is state sanctioned um, environmentalism extreme environmentalism gone silly <clears throat> so the latest trend in banning plastic stuff is the nationwide trend toward eliminating plastic straws from restaurants a commonly given justification for the ban is the fact that there's a lot of plastic garbage floating around in the ocean of course this rationale seems a bit odd for some locations in Fort Collins Colorado for example which is about a thousand miles from any ocean locals feel the need to do their part by convincing local rest restauranters or restaurateurs to ban the offending objects yes we are talking about banning plastic straws there is a reason behind this trust me I will get there by the way this specific article comes from the Mises Institute um, which is a Mises Institute they're advocates of Austrian economics freedom and peace so definitely check out the Mises Institute at HTTPS you know colon whatever Mises Institute dot org it doesn't matter you know how to use a URL one can already see that this will be inconvenient for toddlers and their parents and for the physically disabled but with private firms choosing whether or not to use straws it's not really an issue that requires a strong opinion so not only will it be inconvenient for toddlers and their parents there was something on now this a video that they did where it showed a disabled person who I don't know what they had but the disabled person seemingly kept hyperventilating like they couldn't stop and they couldn't this individual couldn't control their muscles all the way and it looked as if they were hyperventilating and the only way that this disabled person could drink is by using a straw otherwise they would spill the drink all over their face outside of the cup so when Starbucks decided to or when was it Seattle the city decided to ban straws they came up with these lids with a more open uh, hole for you to drink out of so a good I guess uh, a law with good intentions has unintended consequences that we should think about I mean I'm not freaking out because it's a straw ban I just think it's silly and we'll we'll get to the meat of why I am reading this story pretty soon on the other hand when it comes to government sponsored bans on straws things are considerably different this is because at the heart of every government law rule and regulation is the fact that violence must ultimately be employed to enforce those laws indeed Santa Barbara California has announced a new ban on plastic straws that brings sizable punishments if violated do you, do you see where I'm going I hope you guys see where I'm going violating Santa Barbara's plastic straw ban could land you in jail for up to six months and a fine of up to one thousand dollars per violation however the city says it won't actually punish anyone that severely if they break the rule so actually the article is going to answer my question let me answer my question if they're not going to punish anybody that severely why have that written down in the books and the article goes on to say how do we know the state won't punish people accordingly 
Well, we have nothing but the promise of its spokesperson. After all, municipal code does state a violation could land the provider in jail for up to six months and lead to a fine up to $1,000. However, there are no plans to actually enforce that penalty. Instead, the city will do education and outreach in order to get providers to comply. I love the author of this article. Ryan McMakin, you're a badass. Excuse my language. He writes, in other words, the actual statute makes it clear that any violators are subject to large fines and jail time for each infraction. That means passing out five straws could lead you to years in prison and thousands of dollars in fines. In the future, will judges and city prosecutors refrain from applying these penalties because some city employee said they won't back in a 2008... No, uh... They won't back in a 2018 news story. Don't bet your livelihood on it. The city maintains it is free to begin handing out fines and jail terms whenever it wishes. After all, the city was committed to not using these punishments. Why not write the ordinance in such a way that it's legally impossible to do so? Oh, I know. Because they want to enforce the law. There will probably be people punished for drinking out of straws if people are willing to risk that much of a punishment for drinking out of a plastic straw. More likely, these rather draconian punishments will stay in the law books, and whether it pleases the city to attack any political enemies or eccentric who hand out a few straws, then victims ought to prepare to be ruined financially or worse. Yes! This is one of those laws to where, let's say, okay, we're not going to enforce it on the average person. This is just to encourage people to be more economically minded, to, or not economically, environmentally minded. Think about the environment. That's what this is for. Okay, yeah, that's fine, but the law exists and can be used against almost anybody at will. Basically, what they're saying is, yeah, we have a law in the books, but we are going to selectively enforce it. S do you know what happens with selectively enforced laws? They end up being used as a weapon against individuals or personal targets. Whether it be a personal target of the police officer or of the city state. There is nothing new about this, of course. When a government passes new laws, it relies on its agents with guns to enforce it. The state likes to remind people that it enforces laws against felonies like murder and assault. That's good public relations for the state. But in reality, the state spends far more time enforcing small non-violent acts like petty drug offense and even against small-time entrepreneurs who run afoul of regulations banning hair braiding or car rides. Or any other act committed without a license or government approval. Take, for instance, government bans on selling raw milk. Governments continue to shut down buyers and sellers of raw milk. Terms like shutdown, however, are euphemisms to hide the reality behind those closures. So the story goes on to compare, or the specific article written by uh, the Mises Institute, by Ryan, I believe his name is, Mc McMakin. Yeah, what a badass. Excuse my language. He goes on to compare it to uh, the, the act of banning straws to the act of having licenses for hair braiding and car rides or raw milk. Because these are small, small petty crimes that hurt nobody except for maybe the people involved. And there's generally a voluntary transaction. Basically, the government's trying to protect people from themselves. And the government uses force to enforce these laws. They use violence to enforce these laws. These laws are enforced with violence. I don't know how many other ways I can say it. But he draws that comparison in this article to say, hey, the law exists. So it's pretty likely that the government will use violence to enforce this law. When a government regulator orders a private business to cease operations, it is not making a suggestion. It is offend If the offending firm were to say thanks but no thanks, the government regulator would return with armed agents who would then make arrests and cart the perpetrators off to a jail cell. If they resist enough, they are likely to be shot by gun-wielding bureaucrats. 
This, of course, is exactly what happened in the 2011 federal raids on private members only club devoted to buying raw milk. As is so often the case with enforcement of government regulations on peaceful activities, government agents not only made arrests, but they also seized cash and other private property in order to line the pockets of government agencies. After the, st after the arrest came the prosecution, with draconian fines on the table, as The Atlantic noted in 2011, the mood in the courtroom was almost comical when club organizer James Stewart's initial $121,000 bail was announced. We'd been watching child molesters and wife beaters get half that amount. James is accused of things like processing milk without pasteurization and gets such a high bail amount. The felons in court burst out laughing. When politicians and Activists support new regulations, however, they always downplay the reality that someday people are likely to end up in court or prison, having their lives ruined for nothing more than wanting to purchase a certain type of milk or plant, or wanting to engage in some other sort of commerce without the proper government paperwork. Often the people who are subject to prosecution don't even know they're in violation of any law. Most normal people don't keep up with every government regulation which governs peaceful activities. Normal people know that theft, fraud, and assault are illegal. This is built into the human experience. The illegally, the illegality of everything else, though, rests primarily on the arbitrary whims of lawmakers who can keep track. Often, the first thing the victims of state regulation hear about their law breaking is a bureaucrat's demand for payments of sizable fines. So... There is a lot more. Oh, in the end, though, support of any government law is the same as supporting the violence necessary to enforce those laws. The article goes on to talk about the drug war and whatnot, but this, there's about a couple more paragraphs of this article. But I've gone on long enough. This episode has gone long enough, so I would like to basically make my closing remarks about this article. This author is making a great point that all laws require force. To enforce. They require violent force. I, I was going to say force and force. That's kind of redundant in a way. And this person, the article is it, cites, it's a perfectly cited article. They talk about how people who are in violation of simple regulations were getting a lesser punishment than drug dealers and wife beaters. Not drug dealers, but... uh. Child molesters and wife beaters getting only half the punishment of people who have violated laws regarding unpasteurized milk. That's ridiculous. That's the part about these regulations. I don't know. For some reason, we, uh, it, the state will overlook child molesters and wife beaters and they will crack down hard on unpasteurized milk and straw drinking. Think about that. Selective enforcement over stupid laws you put that together with violence, and you get this. You get a $1,000 fine and six months in jail for a single straw if they choose to enforce it. And they probably will. It's it's one of those instances where you break a law and then you are you get pulled over for it. Or you get told by a cop that you're breaking this law. And you're like, huh? I've never heard of that law. That's probably what's going to happen. Or they don't enforce it, so when they finally do enforce it, you're just... You're out of your mind trying to figure out how the hell that even happens. Oh, I think I went into a rant about something so silly. But that's what happens when you hear about things that are so silly. So without further ado, I will give you my closing remarks. On this channel, on this podcast, me as an individual, I like to advocate for certain principles that I hold dear to my heart and principles that I think are extremely under that I think are the extreme important principles of an underpinning of any sort of free society and those principles include individualism free markets peace tolerance limited government decentralization the scientific method and natural law those are principles that I guide, that I uh, navigate through the world with. They are things that I believe in, and it's a really important 
fabric of principles, in my opinion, that I think can almost provide you with an answer to anything. And I added in the scientific method for a reason, because the scientific method, in my opinion, is important when you're trying to reason with reality, when you're trying to sort facts and emotions, and you're trying to find the truth of everything. That's why I also included the scientific method. I don't think that we should ban the use of straws. What I think we should do is I think the private sector should find alternatives to plastic straws. And in some cases they have. The trick is, is to f come up with an alternative that is just as cheap as plastic straws. Because let's face it, one of the reasons why we use plastic straws is because they are so cheap to make. We don't use paper because paper becomes soggy and rips off into your drink. Get a plastic or get a, a paper cup, put a liquid in it, and let it sit there for a while. What happens to the cup if you don't drink the liquid quick enough? Well, we all know what happens. It gets a little soggy. It doesn't. It's not as solid. It loses its structural integrity. That's what happens. Plastic is nice because it's cheap, it's efficient, and it works. Maybe what these uh, companies can do, fast food restaurants, maybe what, what they can voluntarily do is allow you to recycle plastic. So the lids, the straws, that would be a good idea. Just let them melt down the plastic again or do whatever it is that they do. I'm not familiar with the straw making industry. Although I have thought about, here's what I've thought about. I have thought about buying a bunch of, buying bulk straws in bulk, either from like a Costco if they have them there or off of Amazon and just selling them online specifically to Santa Barbara. I don't know if Seattle has done this, but regardless, you shouldn't be punished for something that is easily solved by innovation and personal responsibility. It's not okay to strip search sixth grade girls for 50 bucks. It's not okay to steal somebody's property when they haven't committed a crime. And it's not okay to enforce a straw ban with violence. And unfortunately, that's what the state does. I hope you all have had a great day. I hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. I promise they will get better in the future as I establish a grounding for my personality or the way I want the podcast to go. A lot of me talking in this podcast is me trying to even figure out my own beliefs. Without further ado, I hope you all have a good one. Also, don't forget to check out the description box for a link to my Facebook, Twitter, and other videos. Have a good one. Stay free.